Welcome to the 2021 ARC Scholars Symposium. Special greetings to our ARC scholars and ARC's members, as well as university representatives, members of the business communities, and friends and family. I'm Joe Whitehouse, president of the Northern California chapter of ARC's Foundation. We are so excited to bring you this symposium today virtually. It features the research of our current 79 scholars. We hope that you will meet some of these scholars whom we call the minds of the future. I also hope that you took some time to explore their research in the poster hall. Those 10 halls are grouped by topic. And if you need more time, the good news is that this website will remain live for the next three weeks. You can leave messages with your contact information and scholars will contact you. At the end of this program, you can interact live with six to nine scholars in a round table. The topic and number of each round table corresponds to the topic and number of each poster hall. Not all of you know about ARCs. In fact, some people say ARCs is a really well-kept secret. For starters, ARC stands for Achievement Rewards for College Scientists. Here's a bit of history. It was October 1957 that the Soviet Union launched the first unmanned satellite. It was called Sputnik. The launch of Sputnik caught the American public by surprise and it triggered the space race. A group of women in Los Angeles became concerned that the US was falling behind. They went to friends and scientists at Caltech and asked, what can we do? The answer, support the young scientists. The women listened. Some people say women do that very well. And in 1958, they formed the ARCS Foundation, a national nonprofit that provides financial awards to the best and brightest young scientists in STEM and medical research. Let me tell you a little bit about the track record. Since 1958, the ARCS Foundation has provided awards to more than 10,000 scholars and totaling more than $120 million. What about the impact? Great question. Please check out the Hall of Fame on the ARCS National website. You'll see that our two most recent inductees are Dr. Jessica Mayer, a NASA astronaut and amazing research scientist who got her PhD at Scripps Institute, and Dr. Peter Schlerb, currently a professor at the University of Massachusetts, who got his PhD at Caltech and was part of the team that imaged the black hole that confirmed Einstein's theory of relativity. Our chapter, the Northern California chapter, is one of 15 nationwide. We were founded in 1970, so we're celebrating 50 years of being science advocates. This chapter has provided awards totaling more than $22 million, and we are pretty proud of that. And we are especially proud that over the past two consecutive years, we've provided more than a million dollars to scholars at our six partner universities, San Francisco State University, Stanford University, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz, and UC San Francisco. Before introducing our keynote, I need to say some thank yous. Mom said those were two really important words. So thank you to the symposium committee. That would be Nancy Bush, Susan Acristopachi, Janet Berry, Barbara Glenn, Dolores McMullen, Jerry DeVecchio, Deborah Mann, and our science advisor, Dr. Jeremy Ryder. Thank you, Advanced Visual Production. This is the company that provided the technical backbone that produces this symposium, and they have been great to work with. And huge thanks to our sponsors, Agilent Technologies, Cooley, Gilead, Glenn Capital, NVIDIA, and Silicon Valley Bank. Without your support, this event could not happen. And now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Jennifer Doudna. Jennifer Doudna was born in Washington, D.C., 
and grew up in Hilo, Hawaii. I am told she started asking questions at a very young age. She graduated with honors from Pomona College, received her PhD from Harvard Medical School, and is currently a full professor of biophysics, biochemistry, and structural biology at UC Berkeley. She's also on the faculty of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, the Gladstone Institutes, and UC San Francisco. She is co-founder of multiple biotech companies, most recently Mammoth Biosciences and Scribe Therapeutics. Dr. Doudna collaborated with Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier. Together, they were the first to propose that CRISPR-Cas9 could be used to edit the genome. This is now considered one of the most significant discoveries in the history of biology. For that pioneering work, Doudna and Charpentier were awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Dr. Doudna has become a sought after scientific speaker. We are honored and super delighted that she accepted our invitation to be our keynote speaker today. Dr. Doudna. Hello everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk with you today about CRISPR-Cas9 and genome editing. My name is Jennifer Doudna. I'm a professor at University of California, Berkeley, as well as an investigator at the Gladstone Institutes and of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And I'm also a founder of the Innovative Genomics Institute that works together uh, partners between Berkeley and UCSF to bring genome editing to bear on problems in both clinical medicine and climate change. But today I want to step, take a step back from the details and really talk to you about genome editing, what it is, how it started and where it's headed. So first of all, what is, what is genome editing? What is CRISPR? And this is a, a cartoon that shows how CRISPR works as a tool for programmable genome editing. What does that mean? Well, this is a technology that uses a protein called Cas9, which is the green molecule in this drawing, together with a second molecule of RNA shown in yellow to search through DNA in a cell and find a particular place in the DNA sequence that matches the sequence of letters in the guide RNA. When that match occurs, the protein Cas9 is able to cut the DNA and that event, that cutting event, triggers cells to repair DNA by making changes to the sequence. And it's that fundamental property that gives this technology its extraordinary power to allow scientists to manipulate genes in our cells and in the cells of any organism so that we can understand their function. And importantly, so we can also manipulate uh, those cells or organisms in terms of the way they behave. And I like to point out that uh, this is a, you know, a, a very, very uh, action sort of uh, image video that shows how CRISPR works. It's a cutter and you see the protein holding the DNA and there's the cutting that occurred. So it literally is a cleaver that cuts DNA and then hands off the broken ends to the repair machinery in cells to make the, make the edit. Now, CRISPR is um, naturally found in bacteria as a, uh, an immune system. It's a way that bacteria defend themselves from viruses. So here's a cell getting infected by a virus, which injects its genetic material into the cell, which can then integrate that, a little piece of that viral DNA into a place in the genome called the CRISPR. And these little pieces of integrated viral DNAs are inserted between repeated sequence elements that marks this as a sequence that records viral infection. The cell makes an RNA copy. It cuts these RNAs into smaller pieces that combine with a second type of RNA called tracer that together with the Cas9 protein form surveillance complexes that can search the cell looking for sequences in DNA that match the sequence of the RNA guide. When that match occurs, the DNA unwinds, the protein holds onto this place in the DNA and makes a double-stranded break, like cutting a rope that triggers DNA destruction in the cells. So in bacteria, 
This is an incredible way for cells to acquire immunity in real time to viruses and use that information for protection. Now, it turns out that in our cells or in plant or animal cells, the DNA is inside the nucleus. And if we put the CRISPR-Cas9 system into a cell like this, again, this protein with its guide RNA is able to search through the entire genome to find a matching sequence in the DNA. It also, like I showed you for uh, what happens in bacteria, this protein will open the DNA locally. It allows this RNA-DNA helix to form. The protein cuts the DNA, but different from what happens in bacteria, in human or animal or plant cells, the DNA is handed off to repair enzymes that fix the break in the DNA. And this is where editing actually occurs by making either a small change during the process of repair or by integrating a whole new section of DNA that can result in incorporation of new genetic information at the site marked by Cas9. This technology then offers scientists a powerful way to manipulate genes in any cell or, or organism and to understand their function as well as to manipulate the, the sequences that might underlie uh, disease. The opportunities are, are immense. We know that CRISPR is already having an enormous impact in scientific research, thinking about public health. And in the case of the current pandemic, CRISPR is being utilized as a diagnostic tool. And we also see extraordinary opportunities both in agriculture and in biomedicine in the future. I wanted to point out that um, there are fundamentally two different ways that genome editing can be used in cells. We can use it to alter cells that are already fully developed, and these are called somatic cells. That results in non-heritable changes to DNA, and only a single individual is affected. And that's fundamentally different from making genome edits in germ cells, that means in embryos or eggs or sperm, where the genetic changes are heritable, and they affect not only that individual, but all of their offspring. And so this has resulted in a lot of discussion in the, in the uh, clinical and scientific communities across the globe about the appropriate ways to safeguard CRISPR as a technology in the future. I think the vast majority of clinically useful genome editing, at least in the near term, will be done in somatic cells. That means in ways that affect a single individual. And this is a great example here of what's happening already in clinical trials. So this is a, a well-known genetic disease called sickle cell disease that results from a single mutation in a single gene in the human genome that results in a sickled uh, cell over here, uh, red blood cells that contain a mutated form of the human beta globin protein that results in the classical sickling of these cells resulting in clogging of arteries and, and damage to organs in affected patients. Up until now, we've not had a technology that could impact this disease at its source by correcting the disease causing mutation, but that's what CRISPR does. There are multiple ongoing clinical trials to test CRISPR in these sickle cell patients. This is a picture of Victoria Gray, who was the first sickle cell patient in America to be treated with CRISPR for her sickle cell disease. And she's made headlines over the last year because of the success of the therapy so far in relieving her of her uh, disease phenotype. And this has been very encouraging to the whole uh, field of genome editing that we're on the verge of, um, of a time when diseases like this will be truly treatable, even curable using genome editing. And of course that relies on continued safety of the method as well as in the future, controlling costs so that this technology can be made available to all of those that, that need it. And as I mentioned, um, the, the issue of human germline editing has continued to be discussed very actively in the field. I've been quite involved in these conversations over the last several years as the technology has continued to advance. And there are now multiple international forums that have reviewed the data and looked into the, the uh, potential use of the technology in the human germline in the future, including 
a report released last year from the National Academies that looked at heritable human genome editing. And if you read these reports, you'll see that they basically recommend a series of very strict criteria for anyone that might want to use CRISPR in this capacity to ensure that first and foremost, that the technology is safe. And of course, that it is used in an ethical way with informed consent of any, anybody that might in the future participate in some kind of a, a clinical application. The possibilities are large with CRISPR and it continues to amaze me how much work is going on, has been enabled really by the availability of a technology for genome editing that is widely available and accessible to labs around the world. You know, as I mentioned before, being used in basic research in medicine and in agriculture. And I think that we will all see in our lifetimes the, the benefits of genome editing. And I would love to see this technology used in the future in ways that are going to address real world problems and make the technology available to those that need it. I'd like to thank a large group of people that have been involved in this research. First and foremost, my collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier, now at, uh, at the uh, Max Planck Institute in Berlin, her student, Chris Chylinski, and my former uh, postdoctoral associate, Martin Yinek. This was the original team that worked on CRISPR-Cas9 together to understand how it worked and to show how it could be utilized as a technology for genome editing. I wanna thank all members of my own laboratory and my, my, uh, my spouse and our son and my sisters. This is, uh, uh, again, the, the, the team that's been responsible for you know, my success really as a scientist. And then I call your attention to this uh, team over here, taken a photograph taken pre-pandemic when we had about 15 undergraduate students in the lab who were able to work together with uh, these uh, scientists who were in professional training to learn how to do research and how to work in particular on CRISPR. And finally, I'll acknowledge our financial support and um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Doudna. Your presentation explained the science of gene editing the potential of this new technology, as well as the ethical issues that it raises. And now I would like to introduce the second part of our program, presentations from six ARC scholars, one from each of our universities. During their presentation, please use the Q&A function to ask a question of a panelist and use the chat function to make comments and follow the general discussion on the program. At the conclusion of these presentations, the Q&A session will be live, moderated by Dr. Jeremy Ryder with all six panelists. And now, our first scholar. Hello, everybody, and good evening. My name is Jan Kahula, and I'm a master's student at San Francisco State University in the lab of Dr. Erica Sanchez. We study Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, which causes the cancer known as Kaposi's sarcoma. And in particular, we're interested in the role of a single receptor encoded by the virus. Now, what is Kaposi's sarcoma, or KS for short? Well, KS is a cancer of the endothelial cells. When the cells that line your blood vessel start to divide uncontrollably, they show up as red bumps or lesions on the surface of your skin, as you can see in the image on the right. KS was very prevalent and important during the 1980s and 90s during the AIDS epidemic because it baffled researchers that a cancer normally thought to be endemic to the Mediterranean and North Africa was showing up in places around the world. Upon sequencing the tumors from biopsies of these individuals with AIDS-associated Kaposi sarcoma, they discovered a new herpes virus. This herpes virus, termed Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus, or KSHV for short, turned out to have two life cycles. It has a lytic cycle in which new viruses are actively being produced by our cells. And then it has a latent cycle where the virus's genome just hangs out tethered to our DNA. I'm going to be studying a gene encoded by the virus's lytic cycle. Now, throughout history of coevolution, KSHV actually stole a gene from humans that encoded what's called a G protein coupled receptor or a GPCR, which I'll explain in a bit. Now, throughout the course of coevolution, KSHV has modified this receptor. 
So this viral GPCR, what's unique about this is that it does not need a stimulator or an agonist to pass some signal down to the cell. Now, what is the signaling that I'm talking about? GPCRs, even in humans, are a large and diverse class of membrane receptors that are responsible for various kinds of functions within the cell. In fact, their functions are so diverse that they are the largest target for pharmaceutical drugs, which comes into play later on. Now, VGPCR does not need an agonist or a signal to tell it to pass some type of signal down to the rest of the cell. And it is also known for human GPCRs that this signaling triggers the GPCR to actually be physically pulled down and brought within the cell where it moves and localizes to various locations within the cell. And this trafficking and localization is very important for how it signals. It's unknown, however, if KSHV's VGPCR exhibits the same phenomenon. We don't know how it moves in a cell, and we also don't know how important this movement is for the signaling of the cell. So far to investigate this, I've generated cells that stably express the VGPCR for preliminary experiments. Now, since KSHV infects endothelial cells, I will move to endothelial cells in the future to confirm findings. Now, my immediate first step is to ask, where is the receptor in the cell after signaling? Using fluorescence microscopy and antibody labeling, as well as Western blots, I will determine the proteins that VGPCR interacts with, as well as the localization of VGPCR at various time points. Also, I'm gonna be using luciferase reporter assays to determine how important each location is in the signaling of VGPCR. I do predict that trafficking happens, which is similar to human GPCRs, because again, this is just a modified version of a human receptor. I'm also predicting that this trafficking modifies how VGPCR signals and modifies the cell's physiology. This research is important because if we outline in detail the nuances of VGPCR signaling, it should inform future drug development and intervention. GPCRs, as you might've remembered, are the most common target for pharmacological drugs. So with that, I just wanna say thank you to the Arts Foundation and the donors for this opportunity. My name is Sophie Ruer and I'm a first year PhD student at UC Berkeley. Today, I'll be talking about using satellites to study plants and climate change. Today, I'll discuss net carbon neutrality, how plants can mitigate climate change, using satellite data to answer some outstanding questions, and my own research. For those of you interested in climate change policy, you may have heard the term net carbon neutral, brandied about by people like Joe Biden or folks on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Many countries have come up with climate neutral targets to become net zero greenhouse gas emitters by 2050, including the United States. I'm interested in this term net zero. A lot of countries have committed to transitioning to green energy sources like solar or wind, um, but part of their plan is also planting trees to sequester carbon that we emit to the atmosphere while we burn fossil fuels. So plants are natural climate change mitigators. As they perform photosynthesis, they basically eat carbon out of the air and store it in their leaves and roots and bark. Some companies have actually already claimed to be carbon neutral by planting trees to offset their carbon emissions like JetBlue. Their idea is that for every amount of carbon they emit, they plant some trees to offset that carbon going into the atmosphere with the idea that the trees will sequester the carbon the flights emit. However, there's a lot of issues with this line of thought, um, mostly because there's a lot of uncertainty around whether long-term these trees will actually be able to continue to sequester carbon, especially with climate change and more intense weather extremes like drought and fire. So say JetBlue plants some trees, some of them might die if there's a drought, others might burn up in a wildfire, and some because it's just too hot or too dry might not grow as big and not sequester as much carbon. So all of these different processes would result in JetBlue not sequestering as much carbon as they think they are. And if we're using JetBlue as a model for a lot of countries, which are also relying on this process of planting trees to sequester carbon, we really need to be skeptical about this term net neutrality. However, it's true that plants do sequester carbon. Um, this is a figure showing back from 1750 to the present day of carbon emissions to the atmosphere and sinks of carbon from the atmosphere. So you'll see an exponential increase in carbon emissions due to fossil fuel burning 
and as well as deforestation in this brown color. This dark blue represents carbon absorbed by the ocean. Light blue is just the carbon that is freely floating around in the atmosphere. And then this green area is the land sink. This represents all the carbon that's getting sequestered every year by plants on the land and on earth. So you'll notice a few things about this, um, and these are areas of great uncertainty. Um, there's been a really large increase in this land sink over the past few decades. Um, and one source of uncertainty is we're unsure whether this increase will continue over time or might max out at a certain value when plants just can't eat enough carbon to continue that increase. And what I'm especially interested in is this huge amount of interannual fluctuation um, in the land sink. You'll see some years it's actually positive when the land is actually emitting more carbon to the atmosphere than it's eating. In other years, it's um, a really big negative value. I personally think that some of this interannual variability has something to do with water and drought. So we can start answering some of these questions and uncertainties about the land sink by using satellites. Satellites are really cool. There are a bunch of them floating up in space, orbiting Earth, and taking pictures of the surface with fancy cameras. Um, and we can use this historical data to see over time how the Earth is changing. Another cool thing about satellites is that they can see things that humans can't see with our naked eye, like groundwater and different layers of groundwater. It can also th see things like plant growth over time. This is showing um, plants gaining their leaves in summer and then losing them in the fall. And one of the first research studies I'm preparing to do is comparing these two sets of data to understand historically how different layers of groundwater are affecting plant growth. I'm hoping that water might explain some of the variation we see in the land sink, with dry years resulting in less carbon sunk and wet years resulting in a much larger carbon sink. I'm also interested in predicting forwards if we know that drought and temperature um, extremes might increase with climate change, how that will also affect the carbon sink. So today I told you about net neutrality and how uncertain it is that plants are natural climate change mitigators. We talked about satellite data, as well as my own research questions about linking the carbon and water cycles. I also will say that although plant sequestration has a lot of issues, it's still promising, but what would be even better is putting up less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in the first place, which is why things like the Green New Deal and other policy recommendations that are a bit more um, transformative in their scope make me really excited. Thank you so much for your attention and for your ARC support. Have you ever dropped a sock behind your washing machine and wished that you had a way to get behind there and get the sock out? This is a rather everyday example, but there are a variety of spaces too small or dangerous for humans to enter where we would like to see and interact with the environment. For example, inspecting a water pipeline, searching a collapsed building, conducting minimally invasive surgery, or even exploring an underwater shipwreck. In these types of spaces, robots have great potential to be our eyes and hands. However, most of today's robots are physically incapable of accessing these spaces because they are too big or bulky, have trouble negotiating varied terrain, or are difficult to control. We need new ways of thinking about robot design that allow us to overcome these challenges. My name is Margaret Code and I'm a PhD student at Stanford University. Today, I'd like to tell you about my research on Vine robots. Vine robots are a new type of robot that move through their environment by growing from the tip, similar to how vines grow, and they have immense potential to extend the reach of humans into small or dangerous spaces. In this presentation, I will explain how vine robots grow, how we can steer them, how we can attach a camera at the tip, and how I use them to explore small tunnels in an archeological site in Peru. First, I'll tell you how vine robots grow. Vine robots are made of a tube of flexible material that is folded inside of itself. When they are inflated with air, they turn their body material inside out at their tip, which causes them to extend. This mechanism of movement is a cross between a lightsaber toy, which extends from the tip using telescoping segments, and a water wiggly, which continuously recycles its body material. Because vine robots move by growing from the tip, they can navigate with ease through sticky or slippery terrain, and they can support their own body weight to rise up over obstacles. Both of these benefits are immensely helpful for entering a variety of difficult to reach spaces. 
Now I'll tell you how we can steer vine robots. We attach artificial muscles along the outside of their body. When these artificial muscles are inflated with air, they shorten in length, which causes the entire robot body to curve towards the shortening muscle. This is similar to how your finger bends. Your muscle is attached on one side of your finger, and when it shortens, it causes your finger to bend in that direction. In this case, however, the artificial muscles are made of pouches inflated with air. Finally, I wanna tell you how Vine robots can carry a camera at their tip. Attaching items to the robot tip is challenging because the material that is at the tip is constantly changing. We mount a camera to an outer cap that gets pushed along as the robot grows. This is similar to how a surfer gets pushed along by a wave, even though the surfer is moving relative to the wave. Only here, the surfer is the camera cap and the wave is the growing robot. Putting all these parts together, I built a 10 meter long portable Vine robot system that runs off an air compressor and I brought it to Peru to help explore tunnels too small for a person to enter inside an archeological site. While we did not uncover any artifacts, the robot successfully took video in three tunnels that were difficult to view through other means. It's really exciting that even after only a few years, our research on these new robots is already being used in the real world. In this presentation, I told you that vine robots grow by turning their material inside out at their tip, that we can steer them by shortening one side, that we can attach a camera to their tip using a cap that gets pushed along as the robot grows, and that I successfully use them to explore small tunnels in an archeological site in Peru. Since my trip to Peru, I've worked on additional research to give vine robots the capability to reverse their growth lift objects in their environment, and sense their own shape. Check out my poster and my other video for more information about that research. I'm confident that with continued research into Vine robots and other novel robot design paradigms, we will be able to extend the reach of humans into many of these types of spaces, and we will improve human health, safety, and productivity. And you might just have the perfect tool to help you get your sock out from underneath your washing machine. Thank you. So before I get started, I just want to make clear, this isn't a Zoom glitch. This isn't my screensaver. These are actually my collaborators, Three Spine Stickleback. So my name is Amelia Munson, and I'm a graduate student here at the University of California, Davis. And these are the fish that I work with to study how social experience affects behavior. And when I started grad school, I actually sort of thought of fish, little, basically just little screensavers. But something I learned once I started here is that even fish have personalities. And this may seem kind of crazy and maybe juvenile to you, but this is something that as ecologists, we've been studying actively in many species of animals and have found over and over again. And personality means something really specific to an ecologist. What it means is that there's variation between individuals and consistency within an individual. And now that may sound a little confusing, but I think it's something that we probably intuitively understand. After all, this is the basis for the age old question. Are you a Carrie or a Miranda? Which sex in the city girl are you? The reason this works is because there's variation between the characters, but episode after episode, they behave pretty consistently. They're in new situations at different time points, but you can still sort of expect how they will act. That's what personality looks like in people. And that's also what we're looking for in animals. So we're looking for this variation in their behavior, but consistency with, it, with between what they do. And for my fish, what this looks like is something like they may spend more time out in the open versus spending time hiding. So there's variation between what their strategy is, but there's consistency within an individual. This one hanging out in the open is going to be more likely to spend time out in the open in the future. And we see this in a number of traits, including exploratory behavior, activity, as well as social behavior, which is what I'm interested in. Because one of the things we often find over and over again is this isn't always a good thing. So take this example. You may have a female who's looking for a mate and she may see a guy who's hanging out in the open and she may be really into that. He's super bold. However, predators are also into the males that are hanging out out in the open. They're more likely to get eaten. So there's this trade off, which means that it's not always good to be consistent. They should be shifting their behavior more than they are. So the question becomes, why are fish and other animals consistent in their behavioral strategies? 
One theory for this is the social niche hypothesis. This hypothesis says that their social group matters and that it matters because there's competition in this group and that competition leads to character displacement. So if you can't both be the most active, one becomes slightly more active and one becomes slightly less active. And over time, this leads to positive feedback such that you tend to play the same role over and over again. And I always think of this as sort of how do you plan a dinner party with friends? The first time you're all sort of negotiating roles, I'll bring the wine, I'll host, I'll bring I'll do the music. And then next time you may be more likely to play that same role because you've gotten a little better at it. You're better at buying the wine. You've got new songs on your playlist. And over that time, it comes down to an art where everybody knows exactly what role they're going to play because they've gotten really good at it. And that improves the overall performance of the dinner party or the social group. So the social niche hypothesis is this idea that you're driven into variation between your traits so you can fill all different roles and your other individuals in the group constrain you to being consistent. Another hypothesis is a social conformity hypothesis. This is the idea that social groups still matter, but instead of leading to variation between individuals, it actually makes individuals or group become more similar over time. And that could be because they all sort of become more like the average individual or that you have a particularly sort of influential fish or human who drives that all other fish behave more like themselves. So there's a lot of sort of theory about these two hypotheses, but they've been pretty poorly tested. So what we did, um, along with um, Marcus Michelangeli, is we went outside um, to the ponds around Davis and collected stickleback, which are the fish we were looking at earlier. We brought them in the lab and we basically asked each of our fish, how social are you? And we asked them this twice so we could get a measure of consistency. So we gave them the option between spending time with one jar of fish or a jar with five fish and fish who spent time with the jar with more fish and it redeemed as more social. Then we housed them for one month, either alone or groups of 10 and asked them again, how social you are. And again, we did this twice. So we could look at both how social were they and how consistent they were in that sort of strategy. And what we found is that following social housing, variation increased between social groups, but not within a social group. And the fish stayed pretty consistent in all of our treatments. So whether they were housed alone or in groups, they were pretty consistent in their strategy. But we saw a lot of variation between our groups, such that fish in a group behaved more like each other. This seemed to be driven by particularly social individuals in our group, such that a social individual made all of the individuals in the group more social, which as someone who likes to plan parties, was sort of reassuring to my effect on my social group. Future research is going to look at whether this is true for um, all behaviors. Um, so it may be that social behaviors are particularly susceptible to um, social influences, whereas things like activity may be more influenced by social niche hypothesis. It may be that activity tends to stradiate, whereas your social behavior tends to conform. Um, but I just wanted to thank all of you. This type of research wouldn't be possible without your support. Um, it's really support from people like you who drives this basic research forward that helps us answer fundamental questions about how animals behave. Thank you. My name is Hirsch Bargaba, and I'm a second year PhD student in biophysics at UCSF. Today, I'd like to share with you research that I've been conducting to develop and validate strategies for computed, computer guided design of living cell based therapeutics. For thousands of years, humans have been modulating their own biology using small molecules. More recently, biologics, that is drugs based on biological macromolecules such as antibodies have entered the fray as a new generation of therapeutic modulators. However, if we step back and ask the question, what would our dream modulator of biology look like? I would suggest that we would land somewhere near science fiction's nanorobots. These micron scale devices would be able to sense their environment within the body, migrate to the site where they're needed and deliver payloads like drugs, process information, and perhaps even kill or reprogram target cells. Well, while we are a long ways off from accomplishing this kind of technology through electronic or mechanical devices, our own living cells inside of our bodies accomplish many of these functions on a daily basis. Immune cells in particular are autonomous cells within the body that have the structural basis for a number of these functions already within them. This reality has been the basis for bringing in engineered human cells as the next class of therapeutic modulator of biology. 
The current example of this is chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T cells, which involve expressing in a T cell scaffold a special antigen receptor that redirects the T cells killing and activation functions against a cancer antigen. This technology has been used to develop next generation cutting edge therapies for blood cancers, which are currently on the market and have saved the lives of patients with certain diseases. As we have developed live cell therapies, more molecules have come into our molecular toolkit for engineering cells with new therapeutic functions. For example, synthetic notch receptors are modular proteins that allow us to create sense and respond programs such as this one, which enables CAR T cells to detect the presence of two antigens on target cells and only kill target cells which express both antigens, something that we could we would have a lot of difficulty accomplishing with conventional therapeutics. The motivation for my work is to look holistically at the entire space of synthetic and naturally occurring molecules, which we can leverage to engineer the next generation of designer cells. These include molecules that can function as tissue GPSs in cell-cell communication, as clamps, as locator beacons, distress beacons, and even antibodies themselves, which we can deliver using immune cell scaffolds through secretion. The question of how to engineer cells and how to draw from this toolkit to build a therapeutic function is a difficult one. Current approaches for solving this problem are largely ad hoc and require many iterations of expensive and time-consuming iteration in the lab. I propose to leverage the power of computation to guide our design decision-making when it comes to engineering immune cell-derived therapeutics. I envision a workflow in which we can search in a massively parallel fashion in silico, the design space of all possible cell therapies, test some of our predictions in the lab using in vitro assays, and then validate them in preclinical and clinical models and have a much faster and more precise cycle of design iteration. Toward this end, I've developed an open source computational modeling platform for cell therapies called CellTX, which translates biological designs into mathematical models and enables their simulation. This tool is currently available as an open source project on GitHub. Following iteration and search in CellTX and similar modeling platforms, we can validate our candidate cell therapies in in vitro assays like this one under the microscope, and then move into mouse models of specific diseases where we can test their efficacy with preclinical endpoints. I hope that this work can yield a next generation approach, not only for improving the design of current cell therapies, but also open the way for next generation and novel applications of cell therapies, such as in autoimmunity, degeneration, and beyond. With that, I'd like to thank my advisors, Hannah El Samad and Wendell Lim, my labs, the UCSF Biophysics Graduate Program, and the Arts Foundation for supporting this work. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Maggie Thompson and I'm a fourth year graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. I'm really excited to talk to you all today about my research conducting meteorite outgassing experiments in the lab and how they can place important constraints on our understanding of the initial atmospheres of terrestrial exoplanets. These are rocky planets outside of our solar system. I'd like to start on this first slide. We are currently at the cusp of the next phase of exoplanet science, in which we will be characterizing the physics and chemistry of exoplanets and their atmospheres, particularly pushing towards terrestrial exoplanets. We currently, however, do not have a first principles understanding of how to connect a planet's bulk or interior composition to its atmospheric properties. And in order to optimize the observational data that will soon become available from the next generation of telescopes, both from the ground and from space, we need suitable theoretical tools to model the diversity of these terrestrial planet atmospheres. And this requires us to make assumptions about the chemical abundances of these atmospheres. Here I'm showing several of the common assumptions that are made for the assumed chemical composition in exoplanet atmosphere models. And the assumed abundances that we input into our models can have a profound influence on the conclusions that we draw about these planets. Moving to the next slide, I'd now like to motivate how the outgas volatiles from meteorites can inform initial rocky planet atmospheric compositions that form through outgassing. First, planets in our solar system are believed to have formed out of material analogous to meteorites. 
terrestrial planets likely form their atmospheres via outgassing during a planetary accretion, the phase as the planet is forming and it's hot enough that gases are being released into, the, into forming the atmosphere. Therefore, measuring the outgassing composition of meteorites provides a range of possible initial outgas atmospheric compositions for rocky exoplanets. Now, what types of meteorites am I talking about? For this project so far, I'm focusing on the type of meteorites that only experience mild heating during their formation and transport. These are called chondrites. And chondrites provide a record of the original components that formed planetesimals and planets. And while they come in a wide variety of types, the one that we're focusing on for this work are carbonaceous chondrites. These contain the highest proportion of volatiles, these light gases that tend to form into an atmosphere, relative to the other chondrite types, and they have a similar bulk composition to the solar photosphere, meaning they're representative of the bulk material during planet formation. Here is a schematic of our experimental setup to perform these outgassing experiments. We have a furnace, which we use to heat our meteorite samples, and it's connected to a residual gas analyzer. This is a type of mass spectrometer that's really sensitive to trace amounts of gas. And it reads the partial pressures of different gas species as a function of temperature to which the sample is heated. Here are the main results from our first set of outgassing experiments. This plot shows outgassing results for the average of the three chondrites that we measured in the lab. We have the mole fraction, which you can think of as abundance, plotted as a function of temperature. We can see that the dominant outgassing species is water, and there's also significant outgassing of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and hydrogen sulfide gas. The main point being, as terrestrial planets form their early atmospheres through outgassing, if the material being outgassed has compositions predominantly like that of these carbonaceous chondrites, then water-rich steam atmospheres will likely form. Finally, to conclude, I have two main take-home messages for you all today. The first is that this work presents an experimental framework that takes an important step forward in connecting rocky planet interiors and their early atmospheres. And the second is that our meteorite outgassing experiments will help constrain models of the initial atmospheric compositions of terrestrial exoplanets. And I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the ARCS Foundation for helping to make all of this work possible. Thank you so much.